Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here. My name is Rashmi Danwani. I'll be your host and moderator for this evening. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to invite our panel to take their seats uh, while I briefly introduce what, we, what is it that we're going to do today. Um, so please uh, join us. Um, so once again, a very warm welcome to all of you. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening uh, to discuss this very, very important topic. Um, to begin with, I'd first like to um, thank G5A for um, you know, hosting us this evening and giving us this lovely space and helping us put this thing together with um, working with us, thinking through how we could present performing arts and careers in performing arts um, in India within this context. So thank you so much uh, to Suruchi, Ishan, uh, and the entire team at G5A. Thank you. Um, before I introduce the panel to you, I'd just like to give you a little bit of a background of what is it that we're doing here today and how the session is going to go on. Um, to begin with, um, this session is called Careers in the Arts. We'll be deconstructing structures, roles, and pay scales, uh, and making sense of how do you uh, make a career in uh, what in an area that we all love because as my mother says nobody enters this this sector unless you really love it because career to hota nahi hai. so how is it that we navigate this space and how is it that we build this space to make sense for a sustainable career so that's pretty much what is it what what we're going to uncover uh, today a little background about how this session came to be uh, it started with um, SDA Bocconi Asia Center, which is uh, the Asia arm of the SDA Bocconi School of Management based out of Italy, wanting to start uh, an arts management program called the International Program in Arts Management. It's a, it's a certificate course. You'll know more about it later. Um, this was early this year. Uh, it's a short certificate course of about three months. And um, we connected to sort of explore how is it that they could reach the right communities to talk to them about the program, and uh, we basically discussed it and said that there isn't really a central pay place where you can find this community. And more importantly, we don't know how will you find what the needs of this community are. Uh, we don't have any published data or insights on how do you build careers in this space? How do you navigate the space? So that's where the conversation started. And I think uh, it, it's from there that uh, SDA Bocconi commissioned this white paper that we'll be, we'll be launching today, which, which looks at um, challenges uh, and gaps and barriers in accessing learning and skill building within the art space from the perspective of the professionals. So not from sector leaders, because some of that has been done. So it's not like I'm going to the chairperson of the NCPA or the NGMA uh, to talk about, hey, what's lacking in terms of skills, but I'm talking to people like us who are working in the sector and talking about what our gaps are. So that's the perspective uh, that we took. And uh, we did this, um, uh, this, this study, this white, uh, the pr product of which is a white paper. And uh, the way we went about it is we did 12 in-depth interviews. We had focus group discussions early this, well, now last year, 2019, in uh, Bombay and Delhi. Uh, and, and that uh, was attended by 100 plus people. And we had um, focus, sorry, focus group discussions and public events both. So focus group discussions were, was about 12 uh, cultural professionals across both cities that participated in it. And about 100 plus professionals in these public events that we did. Uh, and the output of that is uh, the white paper. So this was the objectives uh, of, the, of the study. We wanted to understand what our skill needs are uh, in the sector. Uh, we wanted to understand what are the barriers that we are facing to access learning opportunities, uh, whether it's a, you know, a degree or a training program in this space, and uh, how we could provide recommendations both to SDA Bocconi as well as the larger sector to build a space for learning and training uh, in the sector. Um, the white paper is ready. Um, so with that, uh, what we're going to be doing here is using the white paper as a base and engaging in this very important discussion with this uh, very exciting panel that we have here today. So I'd like to introduce uh, the, the panel, starting with um, Alessandro Giuliani, who's the managing director of the uh, SDA Bocconi Asia Center. He's been in India for about eight years now and uh, a, a real champion of, of uh, not just um, engaging with deep learning when it comes to management, but also uh, being very open to uh, conversations about what makes for stronger integrated learning in India. He actually knows a lot of people who, you know, even if they're not from the related field of management or education, and that, 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 that's a testimony to uh, the kind of crossovers that you engage with in your work as well. So we're very excited to have him here. Uh, we also have Ashutosh Patak. Um, I don't know how many of you know Ashu from the Blue Frog days. He was, uh, in some sense, 
And Blue Frog was, in a very clear sense, a catalyst um, at the time when it started in creating a very important space for uh, not just independent music, but also the way the music sector, as, as, it's, as, it, as it is, changed at that time, um, you know, uh, in, in the past couple of decades. And a very crucial part of that, he now runs True School of Music, uh, which is uh, based not actually too far away from here, and has been doing some incredible work with the National Skills Development Council to uh, create a, a, a more stable space for skill development in, in music uh, in India. So we'll, he'll share more about that. Uh, we've got uh, Ishan uh, from G5A. He's the Associate Artistic Director of G5A uh, and cuts across two roles of being the Artistic Director but also in, 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 in the sense running a venue and, and the challenges and opportunities of doing that uh, in 2020, which is very different from doing that in 2015. Uh, which brings me to Amrita Lahiri, who uh, herself, like Ashu, is also an artist. She herself is a dancer. She's a Kuchipudi dancer. And uh, I've, I've known her uh, in, my, in our previous roles, uh, having worked with the NCPA. But she has uh, dabbled, uh, interestingly, across the roles of a performing artist and then uh, working within an institution as the programming head of dance, first at the NCPA and very recently now, the newly established Geo Center. Uh, and across um, these roles, along with these roles, also continually performing, learning, and at the same time teaching. So um, multi, multifarious roles here that we see. And uh, what the reason why we've also put this, put this panel together, as you can see, there's a range of experience here. Um, there's a range of subsectors, cultural subsectors represented here. Um, and at the same time, a range of different types of cultural organizations that they have worked in or started or currently are engaged with to sh then, then bring those perspectives into our discussion. Um, so to begin with, uh, I'll just briefly present some of the insights that we've got from the white paper, which we can then base our further discussion on. So uh, very quickly, these are the key gaps that we identified. On the one hand, we said that there isn't adequate sector knowledge that uh, the aspirants or, or, or cultural management professionals felt that they have to understand and navigate the sector. And the second one being that there aren't enough adequate education options. We don't have a single arts management program in this country that is of a degree level. There are some diplomas, there are a couple of fellowships, but not formal arts management programs. Uh, I got to know in the last year, one more has, has started since we did the study at IGNO in, in Delhi. But um, again, nothing super formal and often very single sector driven, whatever is, is available. Um, there were specific areas where the, the respondents identified gaps, which included general management and strategic planning, financial planning and fundraising, marketing and audience development, and technical and production skills. Uh, in terms of needs, um, we looked at three very distinct groups of uh, people we spoke to. One was cultural sector professionals, people who are working in the sector, the other being professionals who are transitioning into the sector or are thinking of transitioning into the culture sector. So for instance, we had someone who was uh, a flight person, if I'm not mistaken, is now heading marketing for a dance organization. So uh, professionals such as, they, such as these who want to move into the creative sector. And then of course, students who are actually studying the arts or pursuing liberal arts programs. Um, as well, and you'll get a larger context of the formal space for arts education in this country and what it looks like uh, in the white paper as well. So uh, what their needs are, they ranged from, um, you know, uh, a real need for having formal processes and, you know, to, have, to help them enable to do their work better, which again doesn't exist. Everybody's beginning organizations and roles and just reinventing the wheels because there's no common pool of knowledge that you're able to dip into and work with to build the work that you do. Mentorship and skilling was across, I think everybody felt the need for mentorship, skilling, and guidance. Again, we don't have formal apprenticeship structures that exist within the sector. We just end up joining something for internship and learn from there, but nothing is formalized in that sense. And uh, the wider knowledge and understanding of the cultural sector, which was significantly felt as being uh, a, a gap uh, and, and a need. Um, in terms of barriers, what was uh, very clearly evident was that uh, uh, even if I go abroad and do an arts management program or a related degree, how applicable is it in India? Uh, again, have, because if we don't have a formalized sector in that sense, so how do we use that training and come into India and build it? Also, at the same time, when you go and take these programs abroad, um, there's a lot of money that you have to pay. 
how do you re recoup that as an investment uh, is some of the questions that were that were put down and value for money in that sense um, for people who uh, were from a related field um, they didn't know how many courses are actually available so even if they are interested in making a career they didn't know how to go about it is does education give them a leg in to the network and the sector it was very ambiguous so they spoke of ambiguity and there were no accessible knowledge pools that they could tap into to talk about if they choose to make this change what about growth and stability in the sector um, and of course, mentorship and uh, apprenticeship is something that we've already spoken about, which allows them to sort of dip their feet and understand whether this is for them or not, um, in that sense. Um, so in that sense, I think before before we move into the structures, I'd like to first ask the panel your response to the needs, barriers, um, and gaps that you know, you've seen in the white paper. If there's anything that you would like to add to it that you feel in your experience has been missing, uh, especially when it comes to accessing formal training programs. Um, well, as far as formal training programs, that was the whole reason why we, in fact, started the True School of Music, because there just wasn't anything. Um, and our industry, I mean, uh, Chandi and me, we, when we started the school, we came from the business, we came from inside the industry, and we recognized that everyone was, as we mentioned earlier, was kind of just winging it, and people were just trying to figure out how to do it without having any formal knowledge. And the problem was the only, the only thing that was available to people was going abroad, but to going to Berkeley or something like that. And there was another problem with that when we had people from Berkeley coming in and working with me, I remember having some interns coming from there, we had to completely realign everything they learned for the Indian scenario. So it wasn't really applicable in certain sense. Of course, music theory and that kind of stuff is applicable, but when you're actually putting it into, into, into a work scenario, the whole dynamic is completely different. So the necessity to create the school came from in one sense, similar to our intention was Blue Frog, where we were trying to do a, do a catalyst for the industry to propel it forward, and I think that's where the need for it came from, from our point of view, with the music thing. Um, and today, it's, 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 we've been around for, what, six years now? And uh, the whole scene has changed, actually, in the last six years. Earlier, we had to talk about there are careers in this industry, there are careers in the, in the, in the music space, and fortunately, because the whole space has got so disrupted, that there's, when we started our school, I think being a pilot was like a safe job. <laughs> That's gone. Uh, so, so more and more and more the creative fields, I think people are recognizing that there is validity in approaching that with their kids, sending the kids over there because there's possibilities of doing something in that. And I think with our space, it's very small. The people that actually participate in the, in our in our in our industry, so there are very few people doing a lot, and it's, it's a big industry in terms of look at the amount of films that are made. There's music just everywhere, right? Someone's doing it, someone's sitting and doing it somewhere. So the same bunch of guys were doing all that stuff. So what I was talking to you earlier about is redefining what the arts is from our space, and that when you make it into a wider spectrum, when you think about doing background score for Saz Bahuka shows. As art, people would never not think of that, but you're using your skills as an artist in in that in that realm. So I think there is a mind a shift of mind that 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 needed to take place. I feel it is taking place, um, and what's important is the education structures that I put into place reflect that. So you, it reflect the so we we teach contemporary. Western contemporary modern music, which, which, which from its applications are directly related to the jobs that exist around here. You know, when you're doing a, when you, when if you're performing in a Bollywood band, it's pr pretty much the, the 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 five the rhythm section, the five band. You know, you know how to play drums, bass, guitar, keyboards, whatever. You know, so using those skills in this in this zone is, I think, what's important. So it's important to learn the fundamentals of it which I think we have really great knowledge base uh, structures for Indian classical music and a lot of that other stuff because it's come down from generations from, but from the Western contemporary point of view, it's not there. So our need to create this essentially was to ensure that there is longevity in a career 
in the music industry. That means you're not just a one-off artist, and you can use your skill to become an artist to start doing stuff which is apart from your personal art. So I think people need to start looking at it as a portfolio career and feel that is the structure that's going to go forward. You know, there's no real job as such apart from getting a job in a studio or something like that. Yeah, um, there are several points that you raised. And I'm going to bring that and weave that in through a conversation. But one of the things that I wanted to stress on when you said was y people coming from Berkeley, you had to realign because our formats are very dynamic. They're very different. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Because sure. there's something, there's a very Indian peculiarity of yeah. working in the sector. What is that? Yeah, f first of all, we have a different work ethic completely. We have a different way of doing things. We have jugaad. We, got, we can turn things around like immediately, right? And so the one advantage that we have is that if a, like I've done jobs for for Brazil and London and my my <laughs> Uh, by peers over there will take two weeks to turn something around and we in our in our space will do it in two hours and three hours that's just how we are you know and it's not a question of lack of quality within that whole thing it's just that uh, the brains are wired like that and I feel that's that's that was something very difficult when you come from a very uh, okay this will happen in this time then this will happen there and you know so here there's no time to rest you just got to come and do it you gotta and you got to figure out within that process how to do it so that was one big problem right. that that it's not as organized. So when you come from an organized place, you th you're, you're thinking in an organized way, right? Yeah. So, but you need to be able to adapt in chaos. And that is one thing that, that is India. India is in that sense chaos. And I find that very attractive, actually. It's very interesting because you can, you can come up with solutions on the fly which no one else would think about. So that mindset was a big challenge. The other challenge was uh, the context to which you're learning music or the context to which you're applying it. Uh, you, you're you going to learn some jazz in Berkeley, but you're coming down here and doing a, you know, a Tamil film or you're doing a Marathi film or you're working and that. So you need to have a sense of that. Mm. And you need to be, I guess, you can't just, you have to ingrain it in your system. It has to become second nature. So you need to to understand the the why of it, what's behind it, rather than just applying. So even when we teach, we talk about, you know, you can copy a song, but if you are, if you are, if you understand the reason why that song was done in the first place, then you can get, then it's going to resonate much more with people. It's simple as that. So I think the cultural context of India, while you're learning, is very important. Right. So if I was to, if I had a kid, and if a kid was going to become a musician, I would send them now to my school, not because it's our school, but because what they're going to absorb from this is going to help them in the long term. Mm. On this. So it's, there's certain things you can export and import, mm. uh, but there's certain things that need to be like drilled in over right. here. You know? right. And actually, Amrit, I want to take this to you because you um, studied abroad, you learned dance abroad, you did a uh, arts management program at the Kennedy Center, so you've got, in some sense, some formal training in the organized setup, and then you come to Kalakshetra, you work here, and then you work at the work at the NCPA. So I'd just like you to share with us your transition into exactly that. What was the dynamism that you encountered, yeah. and this movement? Well, since we started out talking about uh, the gaps in arts management education and all of that, so that's exactly the reason that I ended up at the Kennedy Center when I was in my early 20s. And uh, because there was nothing else, really, in India, where would I go to learn about arts management? I mean, I didn't even know that there was something called arts management at that time. And uh, so at the Kennedy Center, it was an internship, and it was very well structured, and it's, you know, the United States' premier performing arts institution, and it was an amazing opportunity to see how things work behind the scenes and to see how beautifully and uh, well-structured they are. They had 50 people just working on raising sponsorship. That was like mind-blowing for me. How could you, you, know, you hire 50 people to raise sponsors, and the government is also paying for that place, right? So that's how it works. And then even in terms of their programming, every little detail, I remember once Michael Kaiser came and spoke to us, and he was uh, the director or something there at that time. Amazing guy, had a lot of experience in dance presentation, contemporary dance, you know, presenting big contemporary dance uh, performances. And uh, dance in every 
Performing Arts Center is the smallest budget, the smallest audiences, the lowest priority anywhere in the world. And he had done a great job of making it big and doing it well and getting full audiences. And he said something really funny, which I would have never thought of. So he said, you know what? Everything matters. You have to, like you said, you know, you got to dot the I's, cross the T's. You got to be detail oriented. And you also got to think big in terms of the big picture. So he said, when I put up a poster of a performance, I think, who are the ticket buyers for the contemporary dance programs? Usually it's women. So he said, I put up a lot of these sh shirtless guys on my posters who are the, the male dancers because they attract those ticket buyers. So I thought, oh God, that sounds a little odd, but it's true, you know? So uh, it, you have to think a little cleverly and okay, fine. Maybe they can't, Maybe it's a subconscious thing that they're seeing that poster, and then they go and you know. But all that matters. You know, you've got to have a good impact for people to come and be attracted to a dance performance, which otherwise they may not come to. Very abstract, very contemporary. You know, all of that. Um, so yeah. So I I did that internship at the Kennedy Center. I could have winged it, and I did for a large part. I have. I still do for a large part of my career, <laughs> but. You can only wing it so far. I mean, you can only sort of learn on the job so far because it's a very micro picture. If you really want a big picture of the scene, you cannot do it without getting some sort of arts management degree with great, um, very intelligent teaching, of course. And yeah, hands-on is, of course, it's very important. But you, if you get a big picture, it's very, um, it's very beneficial. And then applying all of these things, yeah, I've worked in a lot of organizations in many different parts of the world. So I started with, from my um, internship at the Kennedy Center, I went to the American Dance Festival, then to Kalakshetra in Chennai, very conservative, you know, sari, bindi, every day. And uh, then uh, I went from Kalakshetra, I went to a project in the Museum Rietberg in Switzerland, where it was a museum. But they had these arts collections, amazing art collections of uh, miniature paintings, chola bronzes, all that. And they wanted performances connected to that. So, you know, there I found a wonderful project for um, about two years. And then from there, uh, came to the NCPA for a few years. And uh, then in Singapore, and now to a new performing arts center, which is Reliance is opening, called the Geo World Center, where I'm doing dance programming. So yeah, so having a macro picture is very important. But also knowing your content very well in a, in a, f in a field like mine, where you're curating all the time, or uh, creating performances and festivals, you have to know your subject really well as well. And the context of having seen what you did from Kennedy Center and applying or not, or changing it, as, as he was saying, for the Indian context, uh, aside from uh, the sari, what, <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 what were the mindset? What did you have to restructure within your own headspace and also to align with, yeah. you know, also so to achieve something here? There's... Uh, the environment is completely different. So in India, firstly, you're dealing with uh, even the content, right? You're dealing with so many hundreds of years of artistic material, I mean, in a sense. And you're dealing, you can't even categorize. How can you say something is really classical or contemporary when they overlap? How can you say something is dance and theater when they overlap, or music and dance? They overlap, there's so much overlap. Mm -hmm. This is not the case in the West, so content is different. Sponsorship, oh my God, that's a whole subject in itself, right? Because there the government is funding it, 50 people are sitting and raising sponsors. Philanthropy for the arts is very common in the US, so that's something they really work on, and they get that. People leave money in their will for Kennedy Center, right? Yeah. Who's doing that here? Not many people. And uh, Shan is laughing. <laughs> yeah, and then of course the planning. So at the Kennedy Center, you'll see that they're planning three years in advance. Yeah, you, you know how the planning works here, right? So we're trying that now, though. At Geo World Center, we are planning three years in advance, trying to. So it's a whole different mindset. Actually, to you in particular, Ishan, because um, you know we, we've been talking about uh, this is an independent space, uh, and you are trying to do something different, and you're not looking, or you are looking at existing models, but you're trying to relook at or rebuild that model here. So, if you could share a little bit about, um, from just running a space perspective, what is it that you have in terms of knowledge pools that you've dipped into? What are the, your needs, your barriers, particularly in terms of skills that would really help, um, but also. In, in direct response to these these two things that we've just spoken about, one is how 
different our context is um, and how difficult it is to raise the money that you do need to to build work here. Yeah, sure. Um, it's a lot of things. Um, I, I guess just just looking at it just from a space point of view, I think that's something that we we do our best not to reinvent the wheel. You know, it's something that we. Uh, the, I think self um, self awareness is important. We, we are a young space, and I think what uh, what helps there is that we can lean on the experience of the people we collaborate with and find ways that work. Obviously, there's there's realities. The lights need to stay on, um, but uh, you know. And then there's there's also just the different. Uh, I think the the contexts are 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 very different in in from a national and international. I think um, context just to to connect what they were saying is that I think people value the spaces in other countries a lot more than they value them here, you know. And then th there's a lot of there's a lot of conversation about a lack of space, uh, depending on wh on wherever you go. And then when you when you have spaces that are in that sense doing their best to create a sustainable model that for a safe space for all kinds of experimentation um you know in what you could argue is a, a stagnating uh, creative country um it's the response i mean you you'd be surprised at at sort of the lukewarm response um because i think there's always there's always this notion that the space is taken care of right i'm bringing i'm the artist and i'm bringing uh, bringing you this thing and I'm doing you this favor, which in many cases they are, uh, but I think it's it's a it's a push and pull kind of kind of conversation um, that I think is getting is getting better. We notice it in different um, uh, the different sections and the different sort of genres that we that we work with. You know, with with theater, it's there is some there is a a model that we try and where all collaborators are sort of considered represented. Um, you know, in, in different, in in other uh, sort of practices, it it's not exactly the same. And then you know, there's we try we try and be as flexible as possible. You know, as as Ashu was saying, that uh, flexibility and sort of willingness to to just do do the do the work is is really important. Um, and just going back to I guess the the barriers and and gaps, I think what's um, what is present right now is is oh you can be an artist right that's that's something that even even then is like a long shot that people aren't necessarily um convinced that how will you how will you sustain and how will you um create a career but i think what's what's what is in there is the idea of arts management as a as a career i think that it's that's something that's just sort of happens to people right that they're like oh you know my I have three friends that I think are great musicians. I want to be a part of this thing, and I'm good at like dealing with people. I did my MBA. I can sort of figure shit out, and um, like I'll be their manager. And then sort of from there, it like it like grows, and then you work with different venues, you know, and so on. So I think I think what's what's really sort of exciting is that is arts management is something that people are looking towards and creating structure. So I think that's something that, you know, we've seen definitely a lot of different people working at an art space also, you know, hiring for an art space. Because if you, I mean, I, we'll, I guess we'll discuss it later with uh, the transversal uh, skills. But when people come in for marketing, they're just like, oh, this is, this is my job, right? Whereas it's actually super interweaved. Um, and sometimes that shift is a little difficult for people to adjust to. Yeah, but as you said, this sort of, you know, I've got three friends and they play in a band. I'd like to, you know, manage them. And that's how pretty much the big one of the biggest music festivals started, right, in this country. Uh, and, and I just want to take that, Alessandro, to you, you know, talking to you about Jugad. Uh, you know, I was just <laughs> about to comment uh, Ashu's Jugad because it's one of the things uh, that is most exciting and most disturbing also <laughs> when, you, when you come to India. And uh, which we understand very well because uh, we have, our, as Italian, well, first of all, I allow myself to speak as an Indian. So when I criticize India, it's because I feel like India. I want to 
say that. And I've been here eight years because I just love and feel it, uh, my country. And But in Italy, we do have what we call the arte d'arrangiarsi is exactly the same thing as uh, the jugad. Yeah. And uh, sometimes, cultures, yeah, so. we're extremely similar, and that's why it's uh, relatively easy yeah. uh, to find yourself at home for us, uh, for us here. But uh, so what sometimes disturbs a little bit, uh, and there comes a little bit of uh, management uh, in arts, but not only in arts, uh, is that Jugad many times is, uh, I, I give the definition as a, as a patch that stays there forever. Okay, and uh, so uh, uh, I think it's extremely interesting and exciting to be in India because of this approach, because uh, India is just uh, skipping uh, stages uh, of development, uh, so anything can be uh, carved and uh, created. You can disrupt uh, a sector, a job uh, in, uh, in, in one month. So that for that is extremely interesting. On the other hand, uh, uh, as we were saying, some kind of uh, 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 structuring uh, around uh, uh, arts at large is, uh, is, is extremely important uh, for uh, it to become self-sustainable, and uh, which is the big problem, big big problem in India. Sometimes when I buy a ticket for uh, for uh, performance, I say, is this really the price of the ticket? Uh, but if you raise the prices, then nobody yeah, comes. Yeah. Okay, so all this has to change and will change. We see it's changing, and again, I think uh, Italy is extremely similar to India. With uh, some uh, uh, ten years, uh, uh, we started the process uh, some uh, ten, uh, some tens of years earlier. So I see uh, now in India happening exactly what uh, was happening in Italy when I was young. Okay, where you didn't have access to the monuments, you had to jump. The, the spikes uh, to go and see a monument, things like that. And uh, uh, what is extremely exciting uh, in what we do at uh, the Asia Center of SDA Bocconi is that we have a lot of mixing of international programs with Indian, uh, with Indian, prog with Indian uh, students. The IPE and the International Program in Arts Management is one of these where we bring some 15 students from uh, uh, US, Canada, Colombia, and uh, Europe, and uh, we form the class with them. Uh, that helps a lot in both senses, okay? As you were saying, uh, the Americans uh, uh, to be a little bit more flexible and more quick, the Indians to understand that some programming or other things, uh, because different programs, different things that you see, but uh, it's extremely uh, interesting to see how both groups learn from each other. And as much as I think uh, a vision on what's happening abroad is extremely important, that's why we, I think we had a very good uh, uh, feedback from the program because it, uh, it's run uh, Mumbai and Delhi, which already is very different, but then Beijing and then Italy. So you really have a uh, different perspective. And I think this in India right now is very important across the sectors. Yeah, so just a context, it's a study tour and they spend a week each in each of these countries and cities. Um, what he was referring to with Beijing and Italy. Uh, but, you know, speaking of structures, and we'll build into that, I just want to share a little more in terms of... Um, yeah, please, please, absolutely. I just want to react to actually a few things that all of you have said. And I, first of all, totally agree with you, the patch thing, you know, that's what it is. If we, we need to look at uh, long-term solutions, and long-term solutions do require structures, which goes back to what you were talking about. That means what we can learn from there. And the whole idea is that if you learn from there with the point of view of adapting it over here, that's the thing. So, uh, when I was talking about it, it was reference to people learning from there and applying straight over here. That's what sometimes is uh, difficult. So, the mindset is about is absolutely about that. You know, I think it's very important because they've already figured out a lot of good stuff over there. So that means we can take stuff from there and, and push it over here. So the Jugaad thing is 100% just a fix, but it can't be the solution. I completely agree with you on that. Right. And um, you know, I, I, that thought that you just said, learning from then, applying or adapting it here, is something I'm going to hold you to. Because I think that needs to be unpacked a little bit then, because it, it begs the question of where does knowledge lie and who creates knowledge? Yeah. And do we have enough here to be able to create you know, the next Kotler, Philip Kotler, in arts management here. I, I, it, these are, those are things that we also need to look at in terms of thought leadership. But, you know, speaking of that, uh, and, and speaking of structures, and they become so important, is just to understand the kind of organizations that exist. And if you could 
share or add to it? Because we did discuss this a little bit before this, but uh, what does the sector comprise of? What are the different kinds of organizations? So we very quickly covered that, you know, there are artistic companies, so dance, theater, music companies. You've got uh, venues uh, such as uh, G5A or the NCPA. Uh, Blue Frog for that matter. You've got academies and educational institutions, SDA Bocconi, uh, True School of Music, uh, foreign cultural organizations and government agencies, which have, I, I feel like in this gap of no government funding and structure, have played a very crucial role in artistic development. So whether it's Goethe Institute or British Council or, or the Orleans Francais, they provided the crucial space and support to build process and practice, uh, especially over the last four, 30 years, 30 or 40 years or so. Um, we, I'm just going to move from their funding agencies like the India Foundation for Arts or the trusts that, that we have, fairs and festivals which are now becoming huge employers uh, today, uh, collectives, uh, independent professionals. You don't really need to be a part of any of these formal institutions, but you could still work with them and survive on your own. Just directly leaning into the portfolio career that you spoke about, and we will unpack that. Um, production businesses, so you may not be a part of a, a formal institution in terms of a venue or funding agency, but you could just be a, you know, in lighting or casting, uh, you know, just managing equipment and how all of that can also be uh, a part of that, or sound businesses, service businesses, marketing, PR, consulting, research. So just the landscape of what are the different kinds of or types of organizations that exist. Is there something that we are missing here that we could add? I would probably add uh, things like production companies. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, people who make movies, people who uh, uh, who make commercials, people who do all that stuff. There's, I mean, there's a that's where the bulk of the employability comes from. You know, when you're doing music for a commercial purpose. So, I think um, um, we we we've also kind of. The, the the musicians we also try to make a company out of musicians you know so now like how the film production companies have multiple directors now there are also some music production companies that do that but I'm talking about the ones that commission all the work you know the film producers actually you know the the, the film business is huge so for us that's a very important part of where we're sending our our students um, what else what else I'm thinking of other things other people that hire. You know? So and that would be different from these production business because that clearly is a content making. Yeah, this space. is content making yeah. spaces. So sure. anything yeah. that is a content making, yeah, right. company. Right. Yeah. And uh, when you spoke about, uh, uh, you know, I think uh, one other thing that earlier we were discussing, sort of collectives and bands in that case, very clearly, which doesn't really fall into the dance, yeah. music, theatre company space. So that's still different. Yeah. So that's yeah. yeah. And okay. and there are the, and then new content making opportunities that are happening right now. I mean, this whole podcast thing is taking up. So it's it's an, suddenly a new bunch of people are doing these podcasts, you know, and which and actually what's happened is the a lot of the film production guys are getting into audio podcast thing. You know, I know Audible like got a lot of these film film standard. I mean, I was wondering why, but they got this. They wanted to start with Bollywood and to blah, 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 all that stuff, but. With any content creators, I would yeah. say we should look at that. You know, from a from a not purely artistic point of view, from a commercial point of view. Right, that, that. and that clearly doesn't fit in here. So thanks, thank you so much for that. That's just sort of adds like content creators uh, and businesses for that matter as well. So where would you put something like, say, a culture machine? Content creators, yeah. Content creators, yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. That falls into that. Um. Uh, Agencies, yeah. advertising agencies, uh, even some platforms, the Hotstar. I mean, you know, I mean, it's it's those are the guys. Sometimes they're doing a lot of these guys are doing in-house content creation. I think that's you. But you hit the nail on the head with the content creation part of it. Yeah. And um, and a lot of these things also are. It's really interesting from our sound point of view because you can take. You can create different scenarios around, if I've done a song, that song is being used in a film, but then I can perform that song, so then now, and then within that song, all the, the singer is famous for that song, and then they can do other shows, you know what I mean? So it leads to a lot of other avenues, that one idea of that song. So I think, and those are, like event management companies and stuff like that, right? The corporates then get involved. So actually, mm -hmm. you look at if you look at it from that point of view, I mean, we are talking to 
we are, the, the companies now that used to hire agencies, used to hire production companies, the companies themselves, like Hindustan Lever, have set up their own, own, they hire us directly. What's weird now is that when I'm doing a job for a commercial, I used to get paid from, uh, from a film producer, the director will get me, and I will work with the, their producer who will pay me, who the agency would, will pay them, and the company will pay them. It's changing now. Now the companies themselves are paying me directly. So they've become now content creators as such, you know? So, so if you, also if you look at multiple mediums, just <laughs> from live to digital to, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot, you know? Yeah. So there's a lot of the digital space, there's a lot of content creation. Okay, thanks, thank you for that. And uh, just to then also dive a little bit into what are these categories, you know, because you spoke about more commercial. So the private, public, mixed and not-for-profit, and I'll just break that up further. So well, we sort of slotted public and not-for-profit together, looking at uh, what could be a public institution. So a government-aided or a run institution uh, would be a public institution. And the not-for-profit would be a charitable trust foundation or a Section 8 not-for-profit, Section 25 or Section 8 not-for-profit company. Um, and then a private and mixed would be, private would be more for-profit, the more commercial, as you said. And mixed would be a public-private partnership or, for that matter, even a f you know someone with a larger foreign... Uh, stake a foreign take into the into the work. So, uh, just just curious, if you were to categorize the organizations that you worked with, could you perhaps share either your organization where would it fit in, or examples of of organizations where? Yeah, the NCP is not for profit. Not for profit, yeah. Um, and wh where would Geo <laughs> Center? Because the corporate art foundations are a, are a huge employer base now. Uh, um, yeah, I can't really discuss it too much because we haven't opened. We open in October. Oh no, let's uh, let's look at a okay, fair enough. Let's look at a but let's say Piramal Art Foundation or Aren't you all also isn't it also not for profit? Um but it operates in a corporate setup. Uh, like that. So the thing is it is yeah. legally a not Financially for profit. Financially it's a not for profit. Yes. Yeah. But operationally yeah. a lot of resources it's easier to dip into uh, when you work and, and I know there are a couple of people who do here who are here who do work for uh, corporate art foundations. So it's it's kind of a very interesting mix. So formally, I agree with you, it would fall under not for profit, but actually, I think it would go under mixed, mm. because it's kind of interesting how that works, especially in the dynamism context in India, in that sense, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah. Kalakshetra was a, a government, a government, right. semi-autonomous body under the government, and yeah. had all kinds of everybody knows lots of issues right. when you have to deal with that. Yeah. Right. Um, well, unfor unfortunately, everything that I've worked in is for for profit, <laughs> so it's very hard to make things work. We don't have the luxury of being non-profit or getting an endowment or getting that. So, but that also comes with its own. I, honestly, from our point of view, I think I think Chandi and me have talked about it, and the fact that we are for profit has act has driven us to figure out models that need that actually work from a sustainable point of view. You know, because it's the div we have to be independent, and in, it's scary to be independent because then everything it's on the line, and if it you can tank at any time, you know you're living on the edge all the time. Um, it's exciting for some people that also gives you heart attacks, you know. So I would l I do I, I, w I would we would love to have environments and situations here where the where there is space for uh in our in our in a situation like a true school imagine if someone came in and helped us out for example that would be great i don't know the structure for that hmm. but we are forced to be in a for profit, for profit situation yeah yeah even though y you're in academia and a lot of academia actually falls into well te technically we're not a school yeah, right you're not. like we're a, we're just a private company you know and where our legitimacy actually came in place is when we started getting the accreditation from the NSDC and all that stuff. So otherwise, we were just a normal company. We were like a tuition class, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and I, I'm going to com come to you in a second because I think that's a very interesting area to investigate, the legitimacy of a skilling organization or an academic organization, and where would it therefore fall into? But before that, G5A would be a foundation? We're not for profit. Not for profit. Um, and how, how does that work out for you? I mean, what are the tensions that you undergo having, you know, uh, in terms of compliance and things of that sort? Uh, I mean, in, we're constantly looking for funding. Um, you know, 
so we we always have to balance the the work that that we have because our our intent for for the performing arts and just generally the as a art space uh, that we have is to push the boundaries to do um experimental work uh, so going going back to your uh, comment about the ticket price that's something that you know if it goes up by even 50 rupees it's you know you you probably you you'll see a massive uh, dip in audience uh, and also it's just the 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 kind of work that we showcase isn't uh, something that every everyone is ready for in the sense that um, you know it's not always easy easy going stuff that you can like come have a beer like chill out like it's like a breezy concert and then go out and then that's it you know it, like some of the things just it really takes um while they're not long performances they they really have a, a larger impact on you in that sense um so that's also just you know people are like oh i'm i've been working i'm tired i don't wanna i don't wanna deal with this stuff um so i think that's that's something that we will we, we'll always always have to balance and find visionary funders and stuff so i think i mean we sort of working as like we we still need to make money so just because we're not for profit doesn't mean we don't need to make money course, right that's yeah. a that's a especially with no public funding and yeah yeah uh, in terms of compliance what about i mean because i know that it's far harder to now get an fcre certificate and all correct which we uh, do have oh you do have okay that's great um but you've not had any issues with compliance in general no we've been we've been pretty solid i'm also not the guy to ask for okay. those things so i just got to reiterate that the importance of places like this because he, he, there has to be a situation where you're not f giving into the commercial pressure of creating something that works because the reason why we are doing this because the things that work are the things that have become most popular right we need to get other things more popular and you need something like this to make those other things more popular so it it is of prime importance i feel in the arts it's also it's going to help the commercial aspect of for for profit people when you have more people coming to hear see more diverse things yeah, and those exactly. diverse things become much more common place so you need places like this to ensure that 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 becomes common place so these are this so otherwise without this we're screwed you know what i mean so otherwise we're just playing around in that same commercial pool and then within that commercial pool you're trying to create something innovative where it doesn't work or the pressure of money is there but you, yeah stuff. but you also like the risks you're willing to take are far yeah. fewer yeah right because you're like i know this formula works for me and if i tweak it a little it's, bit no, that'll work that'll but if work, i do yeah. this then yeah. it's you know i don't know yeah. and the thing is that it's you you go as far as saying i don't know whether yeah. it'll work to say no like it's not even well i'll tell you about blue frog the prime example blue frog was not supposed to be a uh, dive club <laughs> when we started blue frog it was a live music venue pure live music and we had to change it into this night club thing on the weekends where we got the biggest dj's in the world blah, we did all that stuff but that funded my week because on a tuesday who's going to and and we had like 150 people on an average on a tuesday which is not bad but that was not f doing that so we had to find that compromise because it's a for profit thing that we had to do that and then we tried to be the best in that aspect of it but the fact is that honestly when we started it we, we really did not want to do dj's okay <laughs> but we had to Eventually. and then i i learned a lot more because i thought dj's are what they just play some cd's and stuff like that so i had that mentality but the good thing was i actually appreciated dj's a lot more afterwards but that's but we were stuck in that space of of that's the but if places like this can continue to push forward and do things and it's they can take all the risks hopefully you know and uh, and hopefully keep getting funding to take the risks so that we can benefit from that and i really believe that's important right um just to sort of I, okay uh just some insights from the interviews i think uh, what what um, the respondents shared with us uh, largely in this something i'd i'd like to hear from you also about is that um there's a hierarchy in place in most cultural organizations and it's not easy to navigate or understand what those hierarchies are and um the fact that there is slow development therefore of the second level management so depending upon what institutions and structures that you hold uh moving up or moving laterally is uh, tends to be a challenge because the structure is a little ambiguous so the ambiguity um 
came through very strongly. And one of the things that did they did mention was that because it's not a corporate or a capitalist or in this case a for-profit structure, you have to make your way up very slowly and steadily. Um, so I'd just like to maybe perhaps just, just hear from you, Ashu, to begin with, because you've always operated in a for-profit context. And is that something that you feel is not the case that's, you know... You're talking about growth within the organization? Within the organization, yeah. Um, actually, all the... In fact, all the stuff that we've done, the the people who've gotten... Well, we've actually... Let me put it this way. When we were told to hire some very big people, uh, we kind of hired them and we pretty much fired them. But the people that really worked their way up are the, are the juniors who Im imbibed the culture. And, and what happened is that they became... The importance of their roles were defined by what they contributed to the whole thing. So it was a little. So our organizations have always been a little flat, mm -hmm. and they've and they've been very uh, person centric, you know, and and that's how our organizations actually evolved and the things that we we started doing. Um, if you look at Blue Frog, um, I remember having a programming meeting. This was the first time there was just someone who programmed. You know, I mean, before that I didn't know that it was a job that no one had done before. <laughs> So we had someone who come in program stuff. So we had so it, it kind of formalized something that was never done before. It's, it sounds silly to say that, but actually in in India and Bombay there wasn't because we're doing because we are programming three hundred and twenty shows a year. Hmm. So every day there's a gig, everything. So we went into that zone, you know. So that called for that people having to figure it out, and and we saw growth by a lot of uh, personal innovation mm -hmm. and i think there was a lot of entrepreneurial qualities within the organization that led to people their their, their growth um and i think then growth comes from taking the organization to different places so it's a little bit like everyone's it's it's, it's a little different from a very corporate structure right, right. it's a little amorphous so and i think that's because of the environment because there is because we're kind of figuring it out for the first time. With TSM also, we're really figuring it out for the first time. No one's ever done these things before. That's a challenge, and it's exciting, but we don't know. We, you have visibility is very l low, you know? You can't, you can't, we can plan five years ahead, but honestly, six months later, we don't know what's gonna happen, you know, be, to be truth be told. Yeah. So I think it's very individual-centric, and it's very personality-led right now, right. rather than structure-led. So that that's kind of interesting, right? Because I remember that's some of the issues that we also face in the more, well, not-for-profit arts organizations where it tends to be personality-led mm. as opposed to structure-led. Yeah. So I'd love to hear from you on that. And I'm, yeah. again, going into, uh, you know, these trigger questions that we were talking about, which is, um, yeah. are these structures clear enough? Yeah. So and, or not. my advice to anybody who wants to enter arts management a young person would be to try to get in as close to the position of your dreams as you can. So don't aim low and think, oh, no, no, I should start from here and then I'll slowly grow up. No, start and aim and try to get in at the top because, uh, and do what it takes to train and get into that role because there isn't, yeah, you don't move so much vertically, laterally. No, there's a shortage of staff. And once you're in that role, Everybody's working so hard and so quickly that there isn't even time for, you know, taking time out like the corporates do and, oh, let me now change my skill and train and all. No, you'll miss 100 shows and you're, you know. And uh, so nobody's going to give you that flexibility to try to get in as high as you can. And uh, the other thing is that now I see a big change because now that I'm with this new center, it is a very corporate way of working, and I'm enjoying that very much. It's a totally new way of working for me. Um, it's difficult because you have to also, uh, you know, you don't have so much flexibility. There's, there's an HR team in place. There are so many people working, and there are engineers working on the site itself. I'm a programming person working within the same office. There's somebody else working in the in developing the retail space of that center. There's somebody else working on, you know, just the security of the center. And in a sense, we're all doing jobs. It's not personality driven. It's that okay, you are the right person for that job. You do that job. You get this money. Maybe in three years, you'll get a little. You know, you get that scale. So things are changing. And I don't think Reliance is the only one who's uh, starting a new center. I've heard that there are a few other corporates who are also. So those ways of working are translating to our sector as well. 
So you feel it's getting a little more formalized, but even though the structure might not be very evident. Yeah, you know, if, if a company is organically growing, I think it's the job of the people who guide it to have a framework in mind mm -hmm. that's always going to be moving forward, right? But we need to be able to be modular with that framework. So that means it's actually like Chandi and my job in, in TSM to make sure that there's a, we have a visibility for five years and we got to keep guiding the thing, but that, that has to flow the way it, it, it goes. But it is important to always have a sense of structure. So it's not just doing anything anywhere. You know, you need to do that. And that actually is something that we can learn from the corporate yeah. guys, you know, that we can see how they built that whole thing. So now if we can say, oh, wow, I can see that whole thing. So now if we have put ourselves into there, how can we go? We probably will not have the same job functions. We probably won't go that same way. But if it's, a, if it's some kind of sticks over there that we can move from here to there, but we are still have a, we still have a structure, you know? Yeah. It's a little, it's not jointed, but, <laughs> but, it's, but it's not stuck together. You know what I mean? It's yeah. a little fluid. Yeah. I want to, yeah. No, no, I want to ask you questions, but I want to ask you from the question, perspective of roles. So if you, uh, particularly in your case, because when you started out, uh, perhaps there were a set of defined roles. I was privy to an early part of the journey um, that you had a G5, but I'm just going to move on a little bit to talk about types of careers and lay that out and then hand it over to you. Is um, we When we were looking at how do we understand what kind of roles that exist, we said, okay, they're, they're content-specific skills and roles, and then there are transversal or transferable skills. So if I'm in communications in uh, an art organization, I could potentially also work in communications for press agency. Um, so these are skills that you could transfer and that's where marketing communications, events management, HRM, administration production, all of that sort of falls into. But the content specific skills are the ones that once you are in it, you get deeper and the lateral movement perhaps is not very wide in that sense. So uh, as a performer in dance, you could move into dance programming and perhaps writing and research. But maybe not into production unless you really want to do lighting and production. I mean, it won't be a natural organic uh, movement into that. Or for that matter, um, you know, when you're choreographing and you're in music direction, you could work in allied roles, but not too much maneuvering and movement around it. So we just sort of looked at these two broad categories of the types of roles uh, or skills that you require. Um, so this was some of the insights that came from the study where um, we were told that the degrees are very different from the ground realities. I think we've very much covered that earlier on in the session. And how do you apply that to the Indian context uh, becomes a challenge. Uh, but uh, one thing uh, that everybody spoke about is how they've had to wing it on the job. And that also very closely pointed to the fact that we don't have mentorship and skill uh, and, and networking kind of spaces for us to even understand how to navigate these roles and these skills and the growth uh, paths. And um, so I, I just wanted to you know, ask you, Ishan, the first question here is that you are, like I said, you know, staggering across two roles. One is giving the artistic direction, but also you know, in some sense holding and running the venue. How, how would you look at growth path in, in what is one is essentially a creative or a contest content based role and the other being a more transversal or management based role I, I mean I think you you have to try and make time for both because one will always like they'll always push against each other um, you know and in, I mean in, in terms of growth like it, it really depends on what you're looking what your ambitions are right because um, you know, I think as from a, like organization point of view, whatever G5A might be ambitious about and looking forward to achieving versus what uh, the geo world will be looking to do. You know, while we we aim and attempt to plan three years in advance as well in that sense, the level, the, the intent is always going to be different, right? So I think that like... It, I, I'm, I, I don't know if I, like, I think if you're looking at it from just a conventional corporate standpoint in terms of growth, I feel like the rules aren't applicable at all. Like, you need a new framework and a new matrix because there's so many different things available in terms of access, right? Like, you can do so much with so little now that you couldn't do before, right? Like, sorry. No. Sure. 
Um, uh, so, so I mean, and like, it really like it. It depends in terms of. I, I think in terms of personal growth, there is. There, there could be a ceiling, but then it also depends on, on where the organization is going and how much of a say you have in that. And I think, the work that we do and and, you know, going going back to in terms of the the ambiguity, I think that's. That's there only because it some of these ideas and the intent is not so black and white as say in in a law firm or uh, you know in a just a corporate company where you know they have a product they're selling the product I need to make sure I'm making profits right there there's so many nuances to things that that your growth could be exponential but you're just not looking at it in with the right uh, you know uh, sort of context. And your frame framework is is different, right? Amrita, you wanted. So to I wanted to go back to that slide that you had like two slides ago about the content, and then Oops, you had the transversal. Uh, you know, yeah. So it's difficult to move from say marketing, communications, event management, all this to performer curation, choreography, but going from there to here is a very useful. Um, these are very useful skills to have for a performer, for a curator, for a, a choreographer, anybody who's writing. So. If you had to grow, you have to, okay, I would say you have to do it personally. You have to find your own path and see what am I good at? Okay, I'm really great at dance. I've been training since I'm age seven. I can do a, a Bharatanatyam Varnam better than anybody in the world. Uh, but, you know, performances are few and far between. Whatever you get paid to perform is not going to pay your rent. <laughs> and uh, so try to you know look at and that's how i started in ad arts management because i knew that what i'm going to get paid as a performer even if i'm great mm. is not going to pay my rent you know ever so you have to look at going into these uh, these areas these skills that helps i think that's where uh, proper structure uh, arts management uh, uh, programs education is important in that but not only i think also in terms of mobility <laughs> That's wha what uh, allows you, and in fact, most of the people that come to postgraduate programs, they come for mobility. Where they want to shift also uh, from, s strangely, from sectors that are totally different. This uh, applies for arts. We've seen uh, the applicants and the people we have uh, been seeing, but it applies also on uh, normally postgraduate programs. They are, they give you a structure. Okay, and then uh, I, I relate a lot in what Ashu was saying before that uh, you have to keep digging in what is your passion, uh, but at the same time you have to uh, go out and uh, get structured, get uh, your knowledge in what uh, uh, then makes you money or makes some kind of career, but keep digging in uh, in what is your passion because then eventually that's where you are going to mm. to succeed and also I relate a lot in. Uh, there is a path that you have to s to follow. That that's the five years, uh, and especially in India, you have to just follow the flow, yeah. and be able to drive in that flow to where you want to to reach. There were, you know, I mean, I, I, there's an interesting thread here. You spoke about how an arts management or, or any kind of training program would give you structure. Uh, you spoke about, you know, you know what that structure is if you're leading the company. And Ishan, what you spoke about is if you know where the organization is going and how much of a say do you have in that. And I'm just connecting the dots here and I'm thinking that, you know, knowing what the structure perhaps looks like gives you a sense to see that five-year plan and then gives you that say, yeah. right? So I, I see a very clear thread and pretty much that's what education does in some sense. But um, it sort of at least clears up a little bit of the ambiguity. I'm speaking for myself here, but when I did an arts management fellowship way, way back, it did give me more of a say than I had one year previously. So uh, it does give you uh, some sense to navigate. Uh, but at the same time, uh, what what is it that you can take out of a program aside from the structure? Is there anything else that it could potentially well, give Well, for sure, depending on the program, it's uh, different perspectives. Yeah as we were saying, because you travel, because of the people. In fact, in, uh, in postgraduate programs, the most important thing is always your peers, hmm. because they're very interactive, and uh, what uh, where you learn the most if you're from your peers rather than from the faculty itself. Uh, so for sure that. I want to say something I forgot about. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but also, also peer learning in a risk-free environment, and I think when you learn on the job, you're learning with the risk, and that 
makes a difference in how we are learning in some sense on the job even or how you're growing for that matter yeah. you know this whole idea of of moving from one thing to the other is is fundamental for us in the music space we teach our kids to be our students to be music preneurs i said no matter what it is see we are very practical we want to be practical in school if you don't earn money you're not going to stay a musician so figure out a way to do it and 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 it's really annoying because people want to be artists and they don't want to be businessmen so it doesn't work that way anymore you know it just doesn't any any artist who's doing well actually is a business person you know actually so don't fall into the trap that i'm just going to sit and make art and things uh, someone else is going to do this work for me that's bullshit you have to figure this out on your own so that means you learn your, you have your skills you have your core skills you have your ancillary skills mm. you never know like i'll just give an example i was talking to them about when you compose a song there are like five to seven careers within that process of composing a song you're composing a melody then you're arranging that melody so there's a composer there's a job there's an arranger job then you're a producer you're making that putting that content together you're a sessions player you're playing on that thing you're a mix engineer you're mixing that thing and then finally you're a singer you're a vocalist or whatever you all that so there's no reason for you to think that you can't have five different careers happening just there and there for that you got to put your business hat on we i mean i'm one of those few musicians who actually likes an excel sheet because i can understand <laughs> i can understand things like that in numbers because we studied mathematics too and mathematics is music is poetic mathematics according to me so so if we inculcate that sense of self independence and and also this movement is not it's a good thing it's not something that oh because i can't do something here i got to go find something else to do that is just a mindset shift you know actually i'm doing everything i'm not just one thing i'm many things you know we are we didn't grow up with just one toy we have multi your brains work like that and there's no reason why your careers in the arts can be like that so going on to this side of the fence from management to marketing to all that stuff shit if you don't know that you don't know what the product you're going to make and what you're going to create you know i'm yeah. talking as a business person Absolutely. but in fact i'm not saying that that should drive your art but it'll 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 inform your art in a way to get it out and to be successful you need to get it out you know so i think it's important to mix the two in fact it's you can't do it otherwise so that cross thing is you have to do it in my opinion in uh, in the music industry at least as far as i know um i i do want to talk about in house learning and upskilling opportunities but we'll put that during the audience round cuz since you brought up numbers i thought it was a good time to bring up pay skills uh and uh, just to sort of uh, you know this some of the what the research said that um 20% of our um total respondents said that it, because um we don't pay really well in the sector or get paid really well in the sector it does hinder growth and we have no sense of what the um uh, pay skills are like there's no publicity of hey this is the starting salary in the sector and that creates a lot of ambiguity and it puts a question on the legitimacy as well of the sector um i mean i remember my mom threw a fit when i told her that you know i want to leave my kashi journalism job and move into the arts and she had no idea what i was going to do um so what that means is that people who have privilege can therefore access institutions uh people who have a backup plan can afford to enter the arts uh, and 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 that does create i mean i i feel like it's a it's a dialogue we're going to have in another 3 years about democratic democratization of access into the careers in arts uh, but it it does it does uh, take a big uh, step up for us to think about it in in those terms so just a little bit around um what kind of salaries could they be the starting level salary mid level salary and a senior level and how many years does it take to get in uh we won't get in, into direct questions of what that would be and we'll leave that for the discussion but what i really wanted to focus on is that how does one look at pay across these two broad you know uh, one being i'm i'm on the employed side and the others i'm on a freelancers or a consultant side because they both have different logic of of uh, income and uh, relationships that allow for a certain kind of income to be developed so you might be a great musician with a certain number of hits but what you're charging might still be different from another great musician with another certain number of hits so how do you look at those kind of intangible notions that determine your you know what you charge to the client in that sense so my uh, two questions to you in this is one is your response to the lack of data on published pay scales and how does that impact 
you know, A, even for you to figure out what is the right salary to put out uh, for uh, someone. I'll take that. And thank you so much. And the other is, um, how does someone navigate and survive in the sector when we know, I mean, it's an acknowledged fact that it's not a very well-paid sector, at least the not-for-profit part. The for-profit, it's a bit of a struggle to get into, but once you do, boom, like it's another universe altogether. So we'd love to hear from you on those perspectives on survival and pay. Um, as musicians go, uh, we have, a, like I said earlier, we, it's, a, it's a pretty s small industry. There are about 2,000, I think 2,200 composers in the uh, MCAI, the Music Composers Association of India, uh, which is still fairly s small. Uh, when we are getting a job, you kind of know what you can charge in one sense, because it's very market driven, right? Mm -hmm. um, the guys who are successful make a lot of money, okay? The guys who are just starting off uh, make decent money, okay? It's not, it's not bad, because again, you have to do it in terms of what you're doing to make that money. It's not about, um, if I'm just writing my own song for my own album and I'm gonna go and do a show, chances of you making money is very low, okay? So you have to be smart about how you do it. Um, so there's always been, that there's been a battle between, um, I'll, I'll tell you a story about the composers, what we did about 20 years ago, I was trying to set up this union. I was trying to set up this uh, company, which is gonna be 80% of all the composers within this company. In fact, that was, I'll tell you what happened to that. 80% of all the composers in this company and we were making deals with the com corporates. So like, okay, for all these things, there's gonna be a pay structure, there's royalties, all that stuff. There's no royalties in this country, there's nothing. So we tried to put it together. I said, at least we'll have a monopoly and we, I was gonna to prove to them how you'll earn three times more if we get into the system. Everyone said, yeah, yeah, great, great, great. Went and got a place where we put the studios, went to sign, no one signed. Because they had to give up some 10% of their income to do this thing. So they, couldn't, they didn't have the foresight or the, the, the balls to actually do it. And that place actually became Blue Frog because we didn't know what to do with that place. So we said, let's set up a nightclub. <laughs> so that's, that's the beginning of Blue Frog. Um, so at that point, what we were planning to do is planning to have uh, grade, graded composers, like you're a junior composer, senior composer, all that stuff. And you know you can charge so much for that. And with that, you get so much royalties and all that stuff. So we had put that whole structure in place. And, and interestingly enough, 20 years later, uh, uh, we have kind of set the, we have kind of set the stage for that now through the government. So this is what what we were trying to do from a private point of view. Uh, we have uh, our team there, uh, Mr. Nilesh there. He can actually talk a lot about it because he's been instrumental in s dealing with the uh, the National Skill Development Council and the Media and Entertainment Skills Council to create what. Can you believe it? There were no national occupation standards for music in this country. It's just like this, it's for hairdressers and all, there's no national community standard for music. So what we had to do, and this is the this is the benefit of being first movers with a, like we could tell them what, what it was, you know? So we defined that. So actually said, you're one, if you, we define that you're a mus in the music production space, you're a programmer, then you're a music producer, then you're a music director. What that means is that if you have the skills and you're certified as a music programmer, you should be eventually get paid at least this much as a programmer, then as a music producer, you'll get paid this much, as a music director. So the minimum wage kind of thing can kick into this place. But first you needed to have a framework to define what that is. And and we kind of like map that to what we teach. So you, when you do year one at TSM, you get, you get a certification, government certification as a music programmer. Mm -hmm. So our hope is that this system gets adopted into the industry because it's a fair kind of a assessment of what you know, what you don't know. And I, th I think it'll take years, mm -hmm. but laying that framework for this thing to happen is what's gonna make it less ambiguous in the future, mm -hmm. as far as these pay scales are concerned right now. Because right now it's Chinese whispers right. and word of mouth, you know? So that's, uh, I'll tell you another thing. There are companies, I don't know how much of this I should be saying, but there are companies that have that have made lists, uh, that have made categories for certain composers and what they will pay them. So it's an unsaid rule that if you are in that category, that's what you're gonna get paid from that company, right? 
And so, in fact, it's because they know that that composer's work is going to work better for all that stuff. So there is unsaid structures yeah. in our industry, but there's no obvious direct one. And congratulations on pulling that off. I think it's taken 20 years and, <laughs> and one, one venue which started and shut down. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, congratulations well, on, on putting that up. That's well, amazing. Thank you. And, and actually, anyone in the arts thank field, you. if you, Mr. Nilesh Thomas there, who is part of our team, is very instrumental in setting this whole thing up. And he's like, he's been there, you know, hung out with them, got this whole thing done. And, and uh, I felt really positive from what from what he was coming back with, right. you know, then, then, so this thing can happen in other, 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 other places, but I think we'll see the benefits of this in, in many years to come. Yeah. I, I wanted to sort of throw it open to you because you have worked a, as a consultant as well. So negotiating that with a prospective client or in your case, when you're paying uh, different vendors, what are the, how is it that you negotiate this? What are the best practices? What would your advice be to someone who's trying to navigate the more, freelance, especially in the managerial context, as yeah. opposed to the artistic context, that will also be really helpful. Yeah, like Ashu said, it's like Chinese whisper. So we have an idea of what people get paid, but we don't really know. Um, I don't think anybody comes into the arts looking for money. So we all come into it because we love the arts. It's not a place where we try to make money. But that being said, um, becoming independent financially and becoming self-sufficient financially is very important for all of us and especially important for, I think, for women. And uh, so I'm very happy that I can do that. But if I had to support my children, pay their school fees and, uh, you know, uh, support them in any other way, I wouldn't be able to do that on my salary. I can support myself, but let's be honest, I can't, I can't support a family on that salary. So this is what the pay looks like in arts management uh, right now. And hopefully it'll change. But that being said, also, I'm a consultant. So I don't spend all my time in the office, in which case maybe I would be able to support a family. But uh, I spend part of my time in the office and part of my time performing. Now, in performing dance, um, the range of honorariums that I've gotten paid is like incredible. So if you're abroad, it can be anything between two thousand dollars to ten thousand dollars. If you're here, it can be anything between you know twenty five thousand rupees to five lakhs. So where is the standard? So I think it's high time that we had something, and it's amazing what you've done. I think maybe you can translate that for us to dance, yes. but um, sure, you maybe you can translate that. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you could translate that. Yeah, we need to translate that. And you were asking about how we negotiate uh, contracts. So for dancers, there is a rough idea in my, m I mean, I have an idea of the field and how much people generally get paid. Then you look at also the number of performers who are coming. So obviously if a troupe is coming with 15 dancers, you will, won't pay them the same amount as somebody who's coming for with uh, six. Uh, if somebody's a performer who's very well known and has been performing you know, for 35 years, it's not the same as somebody who's a junior. So these are the rough parameters. It's very hard to you know, put, a, put markings on that. Ishan, would you like to? Sure. Uh, <laughs> That's his question. <laughs> oh, we have a bar outside. I can uh, can chat about it. No. Um, so I mean, I think it's it's it, it's something that's that's so so difficult, but so necessary, just because there's there's always that other opportunity outside of the arts. You know, from a financial point of view, there will always always be more. Um, sort of tantalizing uh, in that sense. And so it's, it's I mean, I think w we do our best to make sure, uh, I mean, we're not, we always strive to improve and stuff. So it's, you know, if uh, we're, we're not perfect in that sense, but we we do our best that the people that we work with, at least in our team, are feel a sense of comfort and security. Because I think that once once they have that, then they, they it allows them the freedom to do the work and they're not they're not concerned about like you know how um, do i have these many days off this thing and and it, i think it's it's we're not, we're not there yet uh in you know in an ideal uh, in an ideal world we would have had that before we started but uh, i think just the way we grew organically also it was you know it used to be like five people and now if you count everything and like every team member it's closer to 50 um, so it's a lot of it's a lot of people 
to account for and make sure, you know, so I, so I mean, I think that that's where it begins. And then we sort of look out to the different collaborators that we work with. And I think that they, you know, every theater group or artist that we've worked with has felt that, you know, that when they come, come and work with us here, it is slightly different. You know, sure, we, you know, we might in that sense, comparatively, uh, capacity wise, we might be, you know, smaller than NCPA, slightly smaller than Prithvi, if those are the benchmarks. But I think uh, the the care with which we, we, we attempt to work, I'm not saying we get it right each time. Uh, but I, I think that that's something that you can't quantify, but you still have to, right? Because, um, and so I think that that's something that we will be better at. I mean, hope, I like I know that there's a bunch of like startups and stuff in in the tech industry that have financing where you can go on their website and you can look at the roles that they have available and see how much you'd get paid, right? And I think that if we were able to to get to that point in the near future, that would be incredible yeah, because, because it, it, you know you could you could show people like parents could see it and then be like, all right, like if my kid gets his shit together and you know is able like can do this work then like i don't have to worry about it and, that and partly loops back into standardization yeah you know? absolutely and, and i think i think this this there. is where that sort of like structure really helps because you can lean on that when there is the other ambiguity which which is inevitable um and you know just to sort of tie that back in so there's standardization some sort of negotiation, understanding what the field is like, and then doing the best you can within the budgets. But how does this all sort of come together? Um, and eventually, how do you define value for something as intangible as art? You know, that for us turns out to be the, the bigger question. Sometimes in the commercial space, it's easier, you know, that you sell that many soaps. But actually, it's not always about that when it actually comes to making, because the amount of years and talent that you put into creating something it cannot be quantified by how much soap you sell. So there are these broader questions, uh, but but and, and we can delve deeper into, the, into that with the audience Q&A, but I just want to leave with one last thing before we dive into a quick Q&A session here. Uh, we can also continue the Q&A when we uh, move up for snacks and talk to Nilesh as well. He has been invoked a bunch of times. <laughs> Uh, but but just a couple of things on what makes the difference between a good and a great cultural professional. If if you could just uh, share perhaps one or two things that you would like to say is absolutely important if you want to be a good cultural professional. Um, anybody can go first. I think integrity. I think that's the number one thing for any professional, right? Just integrity. And in a field like ours, which is as subjective as it is, uh, I think it's even more difficult. Yeah, I mean, I think just, uh, just adding to that, that one's... Uh, almost paramount, but also I think communication and care, because one of one of the the issues that you know we I feel at least that we we have is that we can't say no, right? Is that if you you're asked a question, you're like, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. It's like it's okay if you don't know how to do it. Like it's not you know the I think that's something that that's sort of like going back to your you know your story about the if if a musician gets a higher paying gig they'll just sort of ca cancel on you. Um, but, I, but I think that the, the community, and just having that, that care of taking, because it, it just takes a few extra sort of pieces of effort, and then it makes all the difference. So I think those, those three things, for me at least. Um, I have a few. Uh, <laughs> uh, one is, with lines which you say integrated, I think truth. I think you need to be and this sounds airy fairy, but it's not. I think you need to be true to yourself and to who you are, and then you will recognize your revenues based on that. Okay. Secondly, you need you know, we have something called the AQ, the adaptability quotient. You need to be truly adaptable in this environment to be able to move ahead. And what that means is that when adaptable from the point of view of finding your truth within every situation that you go to, you know what I mean? So I think the people that always get stuck are the people that think that, oh, it's it's it's, it's just not going my way and it's not, this is never gonna go your way. You have to make it go your way or you make a way that is yours. So I think adaptability and, and, and being really honest with yourself mm -hmm. is, the, is the thing that all successful artists are about. So I think just stick to that. And Alessandro, you've had a batch of IPAM graduates this year. 
uh, what do you think in your opinion would be no i was uh, kind of thinking uh, what they were saying uh, and uh, it's funny because uh, it's the same thing that you can apply in all sectors uh, absolutely and uh, so maybe we come back to the same thing that uh, maybe the arts sector needs some more structuring and uh, some more clarity because uh, yes one of the biggest hurdles also in order to do, to get students for arts management is the famous ROI mm -hmm. you have no idea what is the ROI if you s study arts management which is not your core thing okay it's just a structure that you're putting there and you invest money and time but what will I get it from there typical yeah I might as well give you one more secret. Uh, when we started TSM and we were talking, we were thinking about our course fees and what they are. I mean, our, our biggest thing was the ROI, right? How much is that guy going to make or they're going to make when they graduate and doing the jobs that we are training them for and what to do? And there was a simple calculation. We Our endeavor was that what you make in one year is what uh, you'll pay for one year. So we stay with us for, and and kind of strangely enough, I'll tell you, we know that we have the figures. We know exactly how much these guys make, the average fees they make. Um, it's kind of balanced out. It's kind of balanced out. But it required, it required a coaching of how to make that money and how to go and do that whole thing, this portfolio career thing and all that stuff. So that means if I'm doing my artistic thing, my own thing, I may get paid five grand to do my gig. But I'll do a Bollywood gig for the same playing guitar for that thing. I'll pay, I'll pay 25 grand for that gig, right? And then I will compose a jingle, then I'll get paid 25 grand for that. And then I'll session. So on an average, these kids are making like 60 grand, what, 20, what 60 to 70 grand a month graduating from, from TSM, where the, where the annual fees are about four and a half lakhs. So, I think it's really important for especially schools and things like that to think about that ROI. I think he hit the nail on the head because every parent is thinking about that. Everyone is thinking about what is this going to happen? And this kid has to make it on their own. How much the parents don't want to keep funding this thing forever. Mm -hmm. And we can keep telling all the parents and the kids, just think about this is you got to pay them back. <laughs> you got to think of yourself as a business that's going to happen that pays your parents back for this, you know? So I think we need to take care about that aspect of it and and bring that into our system somehow so we're very keen right now we're just very keen on now we now we got graduates now we got people who are out there and now showcasing them featuring them getting the industry involved i think those are the things that an institution needs to be really uh, helping the students helping the new talent with mindful of yeah uh we'll throw it open for for questions so if we have uh, questions right now Hi, so I have to say, Rashmi, this has been extremely rewarding and um, I think a very important uh, thing uh, to, to um, acknowledge and, and to discuss. So thank you for that. And um, Ashu, I do want to say thank you for saying that we need places like G5A. I work here and I think um, the more people that hear that, um, I think will help us create such spaces so that we can in fact standardize and create um, sort of frameworks for s such spaces. Um, what I did want to, uh, or what I'm wondering about is, how do you balance the fact uh, of bringing structure, um, bringing, um, in that sense, the possibility of standardization, and yet retain um, the, the creative um, sort of vision and values? Because going, I know that the reason at G5A we've been able to do a wide range of things from ideologically, politically, uh, um, sort of le very left, left of um, center, to uh, art forms that have been, uh, as Dishan was saying earlier, really cutting edge and, and create almost discomfort in, in audiences. How do you um, ensure that the space will permit that? and the safety for that kind of work and that kind of creativity um, with having the, the, the kind of um, structure that we do obviously need. 
Um, that's uh, for me. Um, and then when we talk about pay scales and we talk about just what people want from this, I, uh, of course, come from a different generation. So what I believe still, because we don't have philanthropy and patronage as a well-built um, sort of system in India, I feel that um, the arts really, as you started with, you know, anyone in the arts really comes with that love and passion. And if I, I mean, if I were to think of really figuring a structure for keeping my uh, team and staff uh, in position, rather than worrying about how I'm going to actually get the best um, uh, new work to present here, uh, how does one sort of balance all of this? So it's really a question, the, the question I'm asking is, how does one balance the, the, the need for autonomy um, and maintaining your political, ideological sort of, um, uh, uh, I, I guess, aspirations, and then also creating a climate and an ecosystem that supports it? You can be a structured organization with a very um, alternative kind of programming, right? I mean, with a very left of center programming, but be very structured in terms of how you market the work, how you raise funds, how you... Uh... Yeah, yeah, I mean, obviously. Uh, I don't mean structural in, in that sense. I just mean in terms of getting support from um, an industry that would... So if you, mm -hmm. what, what I mean to say is, where does your funding come from? It's one thing to have the, the structure on paper. How, where does the funding come from to support that structure? I would want to have a team of 50 as well you know, to, to do fundraising, but where is that money going to come from? And once that money comes, does it permit you autonomy? You know, this is, this is a, like, I've been in this twice now. Uh, having um, uh, a venue, you know, I when we started Do Frog and then we started the quarter, which I just shut down. I just shut down the quarter in April. And um, the quarter was, was set up, and I'll tell you what worked and what didn't work over there. The quarter was set up as a small space to keep the flame of live music alive. Okay, so that was our that was our whole concept of doing it, uh, and jazz oriented stuff. You know, we've in our school we've got this amazing faculty from all over the world, and they're these jazz musicians and stuff, and we don't want a place for them to play, and um, so it was open for two years almost. Yeah, two years. It was small. Uh, so the problem with it being small is that I couldn't get any sponsorship because it was too small for sponsorship. And then that means the people had to actually be loyal fans and wanting to come and pay. Now what's interesting is that, I was just telling him about this, the ticket sales paid for the artists for the first time. And Blue Frog, when we started it, it subsidized it. And Blue Frog, because of the size of Blue Frog, it was it was easy for us to. I mean, we were doing about four and a half crores of sponsorship a, a year at a point of time. You know, just like all the booze companies, everyone coming in and doing all that stuff, because because of the kind of programming we were doing and the space that 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 we were. At the quarter, I got zero. I didn't get a single person. At I was like just like shocked. You know. Obviously, I realize now that that it, that the ROI wasn't there for them. But what we then had to do is to create niche audiences for specific properties. And that started working really well. So we started this retro night property or whatever, you know, or the tributes, prop, tributes property. So people started coming for that. So we used to do tributes to, like, uh, uh, Sounds of Cuba, Sounds of Brazil. So people that were interested in that, so I, had, I got my 60 people, 70 people there, and then, and then I had this variable pricing thing, right? So then at the end of it, if you're closer to the gate, you pay two grand for a ticket to sit into this, in this in quarter the size of this place. Uh, so that, that worked. Um, but what was a challenge for, for, for me was to do the F&B part of it. And and then you had uh, had an F and B partner that did not work out, and I got stuck with it, and I, I don't know how to do, do this F and B thing. But if that F and B thing worked, then that thing would have worked. So on that scale, I don't know the answer to this because we're just saying that the certain models. All I could think of was like creating fan bases and audiences that are 
dedicated and really passionate. So, like, if in a space like this, if I knew that every third Thursday there was something that I just loved and I just wanted to come for that, I shit, I'll pay two grand for that, right? So you got to indie music Thursday. In India, <laughs> so I mean, just just if there's so, and then then you can get different, completely different sections of people. But I got my Thursday, I got my Tuesday, I got my thing like that. So you can vary the whole experience in the space. But I think it's about niche targeting and 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 getting just and be really like like be best buddies with your fan with the people who want to come and see that thing. So I get you need. Um, influencers of that aspect of that thing, and people people always adhere to something they know. I know that it's in a genre, it's in a zone that I like, and you need to convince them of that. Then you get the loyal fans. But it, it takes it's hard. It just takes it takes forever. Also, it's tough. Oh, this was much more interesting, but much more hands-on. Mine was a bit more academic in terms of structure. Uh, we mean uh, tools, okay? Then uh, it's your own creativity and sensibility that uh, once you're given all the tools, the different formats that have worked abroad have not worked, once you have that embedded in you, then it's... Uh, uh, we do teach uh, tools, and we do teach uh, normally in all the programs uh, how to unstructure how to innovate. Uh, so the, the most important uh, part of the programs is exactly this, the interactive, uh, uh, disruptive, innovative, once you're given the tools. I might do that <laughs> so uh, I just want to add to that, uh, because uh, just if we haven't mentioned before, we're doing a conference uh, on the culture sector in February. It's a closed door conference. But if you do want to have a chat about it, we're here. And actually, the closing day of the conference is going to be here on the 7th of Feb with uh, Laldeed. Um, so we have our conference dele delegates that are going to be here, and there'll be some tickets on sale. That's a hard sell. But the reason why I'm mentioning that is because that conference exactly puts these questions at the heart of it, right? How do we look at the culture sector? Because what you are talking about is is much bigger than you as a small organization. When I say small, I don't, I don't mean that in any... Uh, in, in, with any disrespect, what I mean is just one organization. It could be the NCP or the TSM. It's small because it's one among many. And we don't have a sense of how to operate as a collective to build what we do further, for which you need any kind of policy or structure which is more macro, which we, A, we don't have. Uh, whatever exists is fragmented, so you've got a design policy, but you don't really have a culture policy. Uh, you have a film industry, but there's no other indu recognized industry within the larger creative sector that we have. So what are the frameworks? There is no policy, there is no framework, and there is no attempt to come together as a, as a collective. Even when attempts are made, they turn to Blue Frog. You know, so basically what happened with that narrative? So I think the third thing is, is what is your impetus as that small person or institution within the larger structure to figure out working together as a collective and coming together to build the sector? Third, that is not really happening. And the fourth is, uh, and I, it's not, I'm not saying that one is responsible for the other, just this is status quo, this is what, what is uh, in existence. The fourth is, which is what will strengthen your position, is having access to information, resources, data, none of which we have. I mean, we often talk about it, right? When we first started talking, we were like, can we please do this white paper? Because we don't have verifiable scientific research to support our instinct. Um, we, we have nothing to say, take to the government or to, pol to decision makers to go and say, hey, this is important because this helps with employment or this helps with, you know, just general well-being of the society. Um, so how do you therefore build advocacy for the work you do? So I would, I would broadly look at these four, four areas because actually everybody, if you look at it, if you take a step back, as Ashu said and as Alessandro said, we're doing really well. You know, we're able to deliver what we do in two hours. We are a highly creative, highly agile society. Uh, but as a sector, we are not able to legitimize ourselves or grow in a way that allows us to be sustainable and comfortable. That's still a massive gap. So it leaves a lot of discomfort, a lot of anxiety, which is not a good place to be in. But having said that, I, I think it's a general positive note. Once you identify what the issues are, it's a step, half the battle is won, because now you know how to attack those issues and get to them. I think the discussions that we are having here is, is towards that. The first one we held was in 
Delhi on visual arts, careers in the arts. And we actually had a lot of people come back and tell us, you know, thank you so much because we didn't even know how to understand the sector. The next one we'll be doing will be in heritage management in Ahmedabad. Uh, just to unpack that a little bit, and uh, I, I know that Sukita from IFAM is also pr planning a few online sessions. So I think how how much can we share and engage with each other on this and build it further would be would be the next step. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure we can talk about it more. At I'm, I'm sure everybody's also hungry, and we're running a little over time. So um, thank you for that. Please let's uh, please join us for for snacks. But before we close, I just want to uh, formally um, soft launch the white paper. So I'd request Alessandro, Green, if we can have the white paper. We've been extremely environment friendly, so we haven't printed the full white paper. So what we do have is um, the formal launch of the white paper. It's just a photo op. But everybody, you know, you can, there are a few reference copies, and we have a bunch of uh, copies which are executive summaries of the paper. So please take a look at it. Everybody who's here will be, will be mailed a copy. So that's what we have. It's a very short 25-page report. Not so short. Um, but uh, please feel free to, uh, you know, read it and get, get back to us with comments and circulate as much as possible. Uh, that would be really helpful if we could just take a photograph with all of you holding it. And we can call it a very formal informal launch